it's easy enough to compile a list of the top third-party applications by just looking at the charts. But here's my personal selection in this show for Android, excluding all the cool Google ones, of course, which are obvious. Hope you get some inspiration from them. At number 10, Google Earth. Don't worry, this is the only Google-made app I wanted to name check because it often gets forgotten. But there's something really rather magical about flying over anywhere in the world without leaving my armchair. Number 9, Real Racing 2. OK, it's a game, not an app, but it's so good, so realistic that I'm stunned whenever I run it up. Number 8, WebMD. Horribly USA-centric, but a super powerful guide to all the things that might be wrong with a hypochondriac like me. Number 7, HDR camera. I'm still playing with this, but it seems to be able to take HDR bracketed shots fast enough that the concept isn't a total pain, and the output is fast and at full resolution. Nice. At number six, Flipboard, news and social feeds all integrated into a pleasant magazine-style layout. I'm sure you've played with it, a fabulous concept which I love to dip into. Such a slick experience on the big Android screens. At number five, IMDB, it's the world of films and TV in your pocket. Start browsing in this and I'm gone for the next hour. Absolutely invaluable and again great on the large screen devices. At number four, Timer Android. I use it to switch my phone to flight mode each night to save power and to stop me being disturbed and then revert it again in the morning. But there are a hundred time dependent things this can be configured to do. At number three, Ultimate Rotation Control. As featured a few shows ago, landscape in any app with keyboard is now only ever a twist away in either direction. At number two, Dog Catcher. Whatever platform I'm using, I need my audio podcast gathered for me totally automatically, remembering where I've got up to in each and cleaning up after me after listening to save space. Dog Catcher is a fearsome app, but once set up, does all of this brilliantly. At number one, Plume. OK, OK, I'm a Twitter addict, always on the search for the best mobile experience, and Plume is my latest darling, ever more customizable, more powerful and ever faster, and all beautifully in black on my Nexus's AMOLED screen. Yes, yes, this is the so-called Bond phone on account of it being in the new James Bond film for a grand total of four seconds during which it showed a text message. So let's forget that. This is the plain old Sony Xperia T, their new flagship. So I guess my adjective plain will give a clue that the T really isn't anything extraordinary. In fact, it's the ultimate in plain black Android slabs. There's absolutely nothing going on here with the hardware design, no highlights, just a slight arc to the rubberized back. There's a flap for the micro SIM and micro SD here, and well, that's it. Not even a removable back, so yes, gah, another device with a sealed battery, a trend which you know I hate by now. Turn the Xperity on though, and there's actually quite a lot to like. The 4.6 inch display is pretty good most of the time, and excellent when viewing photos or movies with the Bravia colour enhancement kicking in. Video support, by the way, is super with a wide range of codecs supported. There's no complaints here. You'll also notice the loudspeaker, one of Sony's best. Boosted by so-called X-Loud audio processing, the volume as well, it's not bad. And the quality's not bad, so it's not better than some of the competition. In addition, Sony has implemented the standard Android 4 virtual control icons, yay. So there's more or less maximum display area when you really need it, and no fiddly controls in the bezel itself. Well done, Sony. We're not talking vanilla Android overall, though. Sony's timescape widgets and tweaks are all over the place and mildly annoying, though I've been trying to use them. It's only occasionally that something really frustrates, such as wanting to add a widget and having to remember to long press a home screen and then tap the corner icon. That, that makes sense, but it's nothing whatsoever like the standard Android ice cream sandwich way of doing things. So putting apps on home screens are done the proper ICS way. <laughs> Go figure. And yes, I did say ice cream sandwich, Android 4.0. This phone isn't scheduled to get Jelly Bean until next year, 2013, by which time Google will be on about Android 4.3 <laughs> with its Nexus devices. Disappointing as ever that firmware takes Sony and the others so long. Guys, forget the extras, keep the OS as pure as possible and you won't have so much to tweak each time. It won't take months. <laughs> Some of the Sony editions are interesting. The standard Android 4 recent apps view has gained these quotes, small apps. The idea, like on Samsung's much more developed dual pane system, is to have apps running on top of whatever else you're doing. So making notes, doing calculations, running a timer, or keeping a small web browser instance going. The idea is nice, but the implementation is slightly hampered by some of the, quote, small apps not remembering what you were doing, should you have the temerity to dismiss them from the foreground. So you have 
to keep the timer up front, to tell the calculator, otherwise they just forget whatever you've entered. The Timescape widgets have evolved over the years, and here they're joined by a few Vodafone ones, this Xperia T being in Vodafone livery. I love the Timescape friends view here, showing at a glance which friends have updates and offering a one-tap scrolling browser, really super. The more generic Timescape feed widget is more cumbersome because of the quantity of updates, far better to just use the built-in full Facebook or uh, download your favorite Twitter client for the full screen browsing. Sony's weather widget is nice, pretty, and there's an Evernote widget built in, I hadn't seen that before. Plus I've got the standard Gmail widget here front and center, and you may notice the enchanted forest wallpaper supplied. Animated creatures hop or glide about from time to time, very cute. Vodafone supply this beginner's discover widget, though it seems to be more promotional than anything else. Finally, there's Timescape's Friends Music, which is actually rather interesting, pulling music track centric updates from your social feeds. I did notice, by the way, you're limited here to five home screens. I welcome the discipline needed, but this may annoy some home screen fetishists. <laughs> Plus, and this is where things go rather pear shaped, Sony's usual editions, some of which are pretty pointless, not least a wise pilot sat now, which you have to pay for, and links to various online stores. Look, I know Sony and Vodafone here are trying to make a buck or two on content revenue, but it's so blinking confusing for the end user. Depending on how you count them here, there are no less than six application stores or portals here. There are four music stores and well, you get the idea. Thankfully, you can uh, order the app menu exactly as you like. So you basically bring all the bits you like to the front screen and never see the rest ever again. <laughs> you get two gigabytes here for storing your installed apps plus 11 gigabytes for media, plus micro SD. So there should be no shortage of space. A gigabyte of RAM and a dual core 1.5 gigahertz processor keep things ticking along very nicely. Inside the arced frame here, there's an 1850 milliamp hour battery, which just about got me through the day, just as well as you can't swap a new cell in. Though I do worry about what would happen after six months of hard use. One oddity on the Xperia T is that there's no automatic text correction by default out of the box. Crazy. You have to know to go into the punctuation, then to press the settings, then to go into keyboard settings, then text input settings, then word suggestions. We're at six levels deep now. Then finally make your selection, which is a nice selection, then back all the way out and then you've got text correction. What a palaver for new users. The camera's quoted at 13 megapixels. Here are a few samples. It's not bad, but I'd still rate this as below what the iPhone 4S is capable of and way below even the 2010 Nokia N8. <laughs> Maybe I'm damning it with faint praise, but again, I expected a little better. Indoors, as usual for Sony's camera phones with LED flash, the results are a grainy, blurred mess. Anyone else remember the Sony Ericsson C905 and Satio and other Xenon equipped models? I do. Testing video capture here on the Sony Xperia T. Looking at focusing and handling of light, dark and sun. Test video footage at full 1080p on the Sony Xperia T. So we have a competent Android smartphone with quite decent specs and components groaning ever so slightly at the weight of confusing manufacturer and network bloatware. Once you get past the latter with a little judicious deleting and rearranging, there is still a problem though. You see, the Xperia T has competition in the Android world, very stiff competition from the older and cheaper Galaxy Nexus with similar specs, but far more streamlined Android experience to the brand new Nexus 4, again cheaper, but with much higher specs and no bloatware to the six month old Galaxy S3, for goodness sake, that's seemingly everywhere at the moment, which is slightly cheaper much faster with a bigger and brighter screen and which also offers geeks the chance to swap in or replace the battery. Not to mention the LG Optimus G, the HTC One X, both of which offer similar form factors but outgun the T for the same price. Look, the Xperia T is a decent smartphone that deserves a second look, but ultimately it's slightly too old, slightly too dull and with not enough sex appeal. Kind of like me really. <laughs>